could. Uh, well, you'll recall that uh, last week we finished up with uh, talking about some of the ideas behind English, early English colonization in the very late 17th, uh, very late uh, 16th and early 17th centuries. And I believe we finished up with talking about uh, Sir Thomas More's utopia, you know, a term utopia, utopian, that's still with us very much, uh, published in 1516 uh, with a rationalization for uh, colonization <clears throat> that uh, it would benefit less civilized, in Moore's view, pe eyes, uh, people, uh, and that uh, you would, if you were a utopian colonist, drive out those people who didn't care to join with them in advancing the course of civilization. Okay, but uh, perhaps needless to say, there are also economic grounds for colonization. Uh, and these became more and more apparent towards the very end of the 1500s as we approached 1600. Uh, for one thing, uh, there was a surplus of people in England. And the other, that people in England might benefit from importing the products of plantations products to be produced by uh, perhaps both colonists and Indians. Uh, the population of England and elsewhere in Europe had dropped off radically centuries earlier with the Black Death, the bubonic plague. But by 1600, uh, it was up to the point where things were getting a bit crowded again. So, uh, there was a surplus, it seemed to uh, thinkers in England of people, and there would be mutual economic benefits from importing the products of plantations, which perhaps could provide work for both colonists and Indians. So, when the English set about establishing a plantation, uh, what they called a colony at the time in North America, its organizers had a body of ideas about what they were about. But unfortunately, in the first English colonial establishments in North America, the economic and intellectual organizers didn't go to Virginia, that first colony. Instead, the first time around, they sent soldiers um, because of the Spanish threat. Remember, Spain claimed in effect, all of North America. And also uh, because Virginia was seen as a useful base from which to raid the Spanish treasure fleets. So the first colony was uh, in North Eastern Virginia, the base of Chesapeake Bay over here. And uh, of course that's fairly close to the Spanish bases in the Caribbean. Uh, close enough to provide perhaps a base for raiding the Spanish treasure fleets, uh, but also perhaps tempted, temptingly close for the Spanish to come up, come up and attempt to do any English colonists in. So they sent soldiers and they sent them to Roanoke Island a uh, contemporary artist's impression of Roanoke Island uh, off the, uh, just off the coast, very close to the coast of Virginia. So an expedition put together by Queen Elizabeth's favorite, Sir Walter Raleigh, set off in 1585, 1585, and settled in at Roanoke Island, a uh, very short distance off the uh, coast of Virginia, uh, in the part of North America that Raleigh had named Virginia. 
after his patron, uh, Elizabeth, the uh, so-called Virgin Queen. And this was the first English colony in North America. Well, the Indians they found there did not seem disposed to flock to join the English soldiers in setting up a colony that would serve simultaneously as a self-supporting agricultural community, as a funnel through which any natural wealth of the countryside could be channeled to England, and most important from the point of view of the soldiers in Raleigh, uh, as a base from which to profitably raid Spanish shipping and settlements. And the English soldiers were as reluctant as any bunch of Spanish gentlemen, Spanish Hidalgos, aristocracy, to do manual work like raising the food they needed. And uh, parenthetically, we can say here that this is, I think, a good example of another truism, another consistency in colonial history, uh, that distant administrators and judges uh, are often a bit more benign in their ideas, or at least less brutal, than the local colonists who were on the ground on the plantation. Or worse yet, uh, when we get to the West, living in the frontier community. And there'll be other examples of this general rule later. Okay, back to the soldiers on Roanoke. While they may have been unwilling to grow or catch their own food, but they realized they needed it. And without the aid of the Indians, they would have starved. The Roanokes attempted to show the soldiers how to make fish weirs, uh, permanent standing fish nets in shallow water, but the soldiers did not learn well. They gave the soldiers corn, but the soldiers always demanded more. While not surprisingly, hostilities broke out. And the first hostilities broke out when an Indian allegedly stole a silver cup. In retribution, the soldiers proceeded to lay waste the village from which they thought the thief might have come. As you can imagine, relations were strained thereafter. The Roanoke people planned an attack, or so the English thought, and they decided to head it off with a preemptive strike. They killed the war chief of the Roanokes and by so doing cut themselves off from their only effective means of support. Without Indian support, the Roanoke colony couldn't survive and it was mostly abandoned after only two years in 1587. When the English returned in 1590, they found the island deserted, the famous lost colony of Roanoke. Well, okay, one down, one failed. The next attempt by the Virginia Company began in 1607, more than 20 years after Roanoke had been established. And uh, in the meantime, uh, English thinkers had been considering a third justification for colonialism. Uh, and this appears in one of the handouts from last week. Uh, this third justification for colonialism, doing to the Indians as the Romans had done to the British. The uh, British looked back at their own history and realized, they thought, that the people living on the British islands, <clears throat> including in England, had been, well, barbarians until the Romans arrived and forcibly shoved civilization down their throats. Uh, this was the variety of history 
being accepted in England in 1600. Uh, the Romans had brought civilization to the British Isles as far as they were able to do it. Never really got to Ireland or far into Scotland, but they did bring civilization to England was the idea. And the English had benefited. They'd been a more or less civilized country ever since. Uh, this idea in turn derived from the doctrine of uh, one of the early thinkers of Christian history, St. Augustine, uh, lived from 354 to 430. He coined the idea of a just war. And I think we all have been familiar with the ideas of just wars, uh, fighting wars uh, for a just cause, for a cause of justice for a noble purpose. So uh, we can credit or blame St. Augustine for this idea of the just war. And uh, it was another good justification, no pun intended, uh, for the Virginia Company's attempt in 1607 uh, to make another attempt to establish a British colony in Virginia. Uh, by now, the expectations of the organizers in England were a bit more realistic. They no longer expected the good Indians of the area to flock to the British standard for protection against hostile, cannibalistic, bad Indians. But the theoreticians still thought of the enterprise as one to legitimately benefit the native inhabitants of America, as well as the British. As I mentioned, they'd begun to think of this enterprise of planting plantations uh, as a later reenactment of the civilizing of Britain by the Romans. And of course, the Romans had had to occasionally resort to force for the good of the British natives. So the British may have to use coercion against the American natives. A sort of history repeating itself. So this third justification, this just war, The organizers also broadened the population base of this second try and included wisely more than soldiers in the human cargo bound for Virginia. But unfortunately, the additional sorts of English included were gentlemen, members of the lower aristocracy to serve as administrators and the unemployed to do the work. Neither group were any more entitled to consistently hard labor than had been the soldiers. <coughs> the gentlemen were something like the Spanish aristocracy that came after Columbus, although they at least, the British at least, were willing to act as administrators and organizers. But of course, uh, even in a colony, you can only use so many bosses. And as for the unemployed, well, they really weren't accustomed to working very hard or steadily either. It's worth keeping in mind that rural life in pre-modern Europe uh, was not the unending grinding toil it's sometimes imagined to be. Uh, people were idle much of the time. That's not to say it was a, a comfortable or a plush life that just wasn't unending labor. Furthermore, in the early 1600s, the English government spread the work laws with the growing population, had encouraged underemployment by spreading the available work as thin as possible. You specialized in, say, plowing. 
you couldn't, or at least you shouldn't, undertake any other part of the preparation of the fields. Again, keep in mind, agriculture in much of England was still very primitive. Yeah, they were using the plow, but England, to say nothing of Scotland and Wales and Ireland, still today what we call an undeveloped third world country suffering from massive underemployment with, however, a somewhat more organized government than uh, some undeveloped uh, countries now have. But in any case, the countryside was still pretty primitive, agriculturally speaking. Okay, so the soldiers were not accustomed to work. Uh, they were accustomed to living off the countryside. Uh, a few years later, during the, the English Civil Wars, uh, the so-called military revolution of the 17th century, uh, had ushered in the idea that soldiers should be paid regularly rather than ever be permitted to live off the land. Uh, the term was living on free quarter. But the soldiers that came first to Roanoke Island and then to Jamestown uh, were still accustomed to living off the land, which this in America often meant living off the local people. So the problems, laborers and the poor not accustomed to working steadily, gentlemen not accustomed to soiling their hands with manual work and contemptuous of the low-life soldiers and laborers. And none of the three varieties of Englishmen, uh, aristocracy, laborers, and soldiers, had had any experience with, with what was to them a climate and a countryside radically different from that of any part of the British Isles. So, while the promoters of the colony that was planted at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607 had every expectation that the colonists would become self-supporting, they were, again, idealists at a distance. They had provided the intellectual rationale for the establishment of British plantations in the New World, but they didn't go to Virginia. And the people who did go had other ideas. The result is none too surprising. The leader who emerged from the early chaos in Jamestown was the character legendary in an early American history, John Smith. Smith, unfortunately, saw himself as a Cortez, a Spanish conquistador, rather than as a leader of benign and reasonable Englishmen. Far from being a Protestant standard bearer determined to treat the Indians decently, he was sure the Spanish had been right in their approach to the native people. At first, it looked like things in Jamestown were going to go the way they had at Roanoke, chaos and starvation. Only rigid iron discipline, it seemed to Smith, could save Jamestown. First Smith, and after he left his successes, imposed that discipline. The harshness of the English to the Indians was only outdone by the harshness of the government of the colony to their subordinates. Death was prescribed and imposed for killing chickens, for stealing food, or for running away to the Indians. More on this in just a bit. One man who stole two or three pints of oatmeal was chained to a tree after having a needle thrust, thrust through his tongue, and he was left chained to the tree until he starved. The need for this iron discipline was clear, the leadership thought. Like the Roanoke colony a generation earlier, the colonists simply wouldn't work. 
by the standards of Spanish colonial theory, this would have been unobjectionable. Spaniards weren't expected to work. But in English Reformation theory, work was a virtue to be expected, at least from the common people, and even administrative work from the aristocracy, or at least the lower levels of it. Well, Smith and his successes may have been brutal, but they weren't stupid. They realized that while they could buy or coerce some foodstuffs from the local Indians, a plantation couldn't survive indefinitely on, fought, on food looted or forced from the locals. So when the nearby Native Americans proved unwilling to act as, as lava masters indefinitely for the colonists, and the colonists were bowling in the streets when they should have been planting, it really seemed clear that iron military discipline was the only answer. Well, they went through some really harsh times, but driven by Smith, the colony survived. From the beginning in 1607, the relations with the Native Americans had been uneven, sometimes okay, sometimes violent. The local people had attacked the settlers only a few weeks after their arrival, more on this and why later. And the contacts between the British and the Native people for the next 10 years were a pattern of back and forth guerrilla warfare and raids, separated by purchases of food by the British. The native people provided food in return for, for trade goods, trade goods like this iron hoe uh, from the period. Next to the iron hoe is a bison shoulder blade hoe. If you're digging up the ground, a bison shoulder blade hoe uh, brought in from further west uh, or pieces of wood were about all you had. Iron, not steel, but an iron hoe was considerably better uh, for digging up for your garden. Well, the local people could see that this was superior technology. It reinforced their lifestyle. It helped them to garden, to grow crops a bit more efficiently. So yes, they were willing to trade food for useful commodities like an iron hoe. There were other things that the British had that the local people wanted. Cloth, for example, woven cloth. I remember the Pueblos were the only North American Indians with the use of woven wooden cloth. Uh, everyone else used hides and sometimes, depending on the locale, uh, various plant fibers, uh, including tree bark. But there are also other metal goods, like these hoes, such as knives, axes, pots, pans, and eventually guns. So what I'm saying is that the local people wanted goods that reinforced their way of life. They weren't remotely interested in altering their way of life, uh, particularly going by what they had seen of the British colonists so far. And there'll be more on trade in a bit uh, when we get to a, a more detailed analysis of that. And again, it might be useful, useful to pause here and uh, take a quick look at the uh, spread of the reality of cotton and maize, corn, in North America before the arrival of the Europeans. Uh, throughout 
virtually all of the eastern United States, what became the eastern United States, including Virginia and going up into southern New England and a bit up into what's now New Brunswick, you had corn, you had maize. Uh, you only had cotton uh, down here in Central America and the Southwest. So uh, the local native people were growing corn and beans and several other local crops and trading with the native, with the uh, British, with the British colonists. And perversely, when the colonists were warring rather than trading, the settlers attacked the Indians and in fits of peak destroyed their fields, without which the settlers were likely to starve the next winter. Well, things were tough. Uh, between John Smith's iron discipline and the reluctant work in the new colonists' fields, many settlers ran away to the Indians, and the severest penalties of the British authorities were reserved for those captured colonists who had fled, fled to the natives from the harsh discipline of the Jamestown government. In the spring of 1612, uh, by which time the colony was reasonably well established, but still under iron discipline, the colony's governor wrecked vengeance upon a group of settlers returned from a stay with the Indians. As one witness said, and I'm quoting, some he appointed to be hanged, some burned, some to be broken upon wheels, others to be staked, and some to be shot to death. Well, why were the colonial authorities so violent against runaways? <clears throat> it must have been maddening for both the theorists back in England and for the commanders in Virginia. Not only were the native people not flocking to the British for protection from brutal Spaniards or from bad Indians, not only were they not seeking the boons of civilization, they were luring away Englishmen who were skulking away from the iron discipline of Jamestown to the relatively easy life of the neighbor, neighboring Powhatan Indians, the neighboring Powhatan Indians. Okay, uh, <clears throat> let's open it up for <clears throat> a few questions and comments before we get to talking about the local Powhatan Indians and going into more detail on uh, their relationship with the colonists. Remember so, that you can unmute yourself to ask that question or if you have trouble with that you can in the chat box let me know you're having trouble and I will assist you. What state was Jamestown in? Uh, it's in what's now the state of Virginia. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Raleigh named it the colony of Virginia uh, after the so-called Virgin Queen, Queen Elizabeth. Okay. So it's in northeastern Virginia. And uh, let's see, actually, oh yeah, there's, there's the location Okay. Oh. At the lower end of Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Okay, anything else? Hey, Alan. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you were mentioning Rona Colony and so on. And uh, the um, the people who founded the colony, the the role of uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the person who uh, financed the founding of that colony, Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, 
Yeah, Raleigh. Yeah, Raleigh was the one who named Virginia, and yeah, he was largely behind the financing, Sir Wally Raleigh. Yeah, and I understand that uh, after a while, um, he got into kind of a, a bad relationship with Queen Elizabeth and then went to trial and was found guilty of, of working with the Stuarts in Scotland. Yeah, I believe that's true. I haven't read up on that for a very long time. But uh, 1607 was the, the act of uh, the joint monarchy between uh, Scotland and England. After 1607, we're a bit more justified in talking about the British rather than just the English. Uh, I say 1607, 1603, I think. Uh huh. Somebody might be able to correct me on that, Daddy. I think 1603, when Elizabeth died, uh, she had no direct heirs, so King James the Sixth of Scotland became King James the First of England. Uh, but yeah, uh, before that, Raleigh got in a major kerfuffle with uh, with Elizabeth, but uh, I'm not qualified to address that. <laughs> I just, I just think it's interesting, you know, the political context that's going on at the same time that the colonies were being uh, formed over here. And the, the fact that uh, there was a, originally somewhat of a peaceful relationship between the indigenous peoples and the original colonies. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Uh. You know, uh, uh, Alan, um, my father uh, grew up in Mississippi. He was um, in a family, there were f uh, three boys and two girls, and um, lived on about 60, 70 acres. And I learned from him that growing cotton was really a difficult crop to grow. It had a long growing season. You had to plant it. You had to weed it repeatedly, otherwise the weeds outgrew it. You had to go through the plants frequently and pluck off boll weevils. And sometime in the late fall, like September, October, then you went back and picked the cotton, you know, pull the bowls out. So, you know, I drive through the countryside and you see corn or wheat growing and and the implication in my mind is kind of, well, you know, they plowed it and sowed the seeds in the springtime or sometime, and then they came back later with a machine and harvested it. Well, at the time that you're talking about growing things like corn and cotton, that was hard, long work to be doing. Yeah, cotton, cotton certainly was. Uh, you can see why they uh, turned it over to the slaves, cotton, sugar, and so on. Uh, horticultural gardening uh, was a little less, considerably less difficult. I'm not saying that there wasn't difficult work involved, but I don't think that the uh, cultivation of a variety of food crops uh, cotton, I mean maize, uh, corn, uh, squash, beans, uh, a number of other crops, particularly when supplemented by uh, the fruits and berries that you could gather and on the coast uh, by fishing. Uh, coastal and riverine native people also invariably involved fishing, produced a pretty nutritious diet and not with anything like the the grinding labor that growing cotton on a large scale involved. Uh, the other thing I think with, with cotton in the American South as it developed in the, the plantation period is it was large scale and there's a whole lot more work involved in large scale 
agriculture, intensive large scale agriculture, than there is in smallish garden spots. But the difficulty in successfully raising cotton, I think, has something to do with the fact that cotton never really spread beyond uh, Mexico, uh, other than to uh, the Pueblo country. Uh, it was never a casually, relatively casually, horticulturally grown crop. You needed more intensive labor. And I can't pretend to be a, an expert on, thank goodness, on cotton cultivation, but uh, I think for the amount of cloth you got out of it, uh, you're right, Bill, that there was a good deal, there is a good deal of labor involved. Whereas with corn, beans, squash, uh, you get a decent diet uh, without a lot of really sustained labor. The same thing I think was true back in England, where, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, country folk, the rural peasantry in England, uh, was not really accustomed to working long, diligent hours. Yeah, during the harvest time, you had to work hard. When you were planting, you had to work hard. Um, but provided you had decent rain uh, or some uh, decent as to streams, you know, the labor wasn't anything like involved in large scale agriculture. Okay? Just wanted to mention one little quick thing. Sure. In locating Roanoke Island today, if you go, if you visit the Outer Banks, um, Roanoke is where you cross over that island, it's hardly an island. You cross over um, to Nags Head and Kitty Hawk. That's really right there. I mean, it's the entrance. Roanoke is the entrance to the Outer Banks, and um, so you can stop and do museums and things there. And also down where you're talking about um, uh, Jamestown, they have a beautiful. Um, area to tour that includes Williamsburg, Yorktown, and Jamestown, yeah. which is called the Historic Triangle. And you can tour that in just a day or two. And um, anyway, just wanted to mention that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Andrea. Uh, yeah, Jamestown, uh, the, the whole historic district down there, I haven't been there for gosh, 40 years. And I think they've improved it a good deal since then. At that time, I remember being disappointed that they had very little, if anything, to say about uh, the early years of importing slaves. And I gather they do now. But yeah, um, have you been to Roanoke Island itself? Um, I have, and if um, the Tafts are on, if if the Tafts are here, I think we, um, they went to Roanoke Island and possibly went canoeing around the area. Um, are the, I don't know if the Tafts are here with us today, Bill Taft, but um, it's, there's not a whole lot because it just disappeared. But they're just, there's a museum and that kind of thing. And I have to say, I didn't go to it, but I noticed that um, that it really is, is um, there's not much to it. Whereas the historic triangle down where Jamestown is, they've really developed that yeah. into a lovely, uh, na almost like a national park. Very nice. Yeah, that, that historic triangle is impressive. I think it goes back to the 30s when, the Rockefellers began putting some money into it. But in any case, okay, thanks much. Anything else? Alan, how about the growing of hemp in early America? I'm sorry, what was that, Wendy? Um, how about them growing hemp in early America? It was introduced in 1606. And why didn't they just use that instead of cotton? 
the I'm sorry, I, my hearing is, is pretty low. Oh, um, oh. In 1606, they started using or growing hemp in a, early America. And why didn't they just use that instead of cotton since it grew so much easier? Well, I don't know. That's a good point. I don't know. I don't know anything about. Uh, I don't know anything about the introduction of hemp. How widely was it cultivated after 1606? Do you know? Well, it was actually required for them to grow it because they used it for rope and all kinds of things. Okay, hemp. That's back in the news now, but yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for that point. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't familiar with the introduction of hemp uh, in 1606. I'll see what I can find out about it. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Bill, you're unmuted. Did you want to add anything to what Andrea said? No, I'm good. She's about right. covered. Okay, I will put everyone back on mute then, Alan. Okay. Okay, where were we? Um, yeah, I was <clears throat> beginning to talk about the Powhatan Indians, the uh, people of the Jamestown colonists were interacting with. And you'll remember this map, it's also a handout. And here's the Poetans located in Eastern Virginia uh, as part of the Northeast uh, Eastern Woodlands people. And you'll also notice on this map that we've got a somewhat larger, a denser rather population in this area, partly because of the climate, uh, reasonably easy agriculture, horticulture rather, uh, reasonably easy gardening, reasonably easy to grow things. Uh, not the high population density that you had down in the Pueblo country, to say nothing of Mesoamerica, but uh, still substantial compared with most of the rest of North America, with the exception of California, uh, which we'll get to, well, not in this course, but uh, possibly in the future, an explanation for the denser population in uh, California and up into Oregon and Washington. But okay, we've got a relatively dense population of native people. And we have these uh, native people in the Algonquian, the Algonquian language group, one of the, the major major language groups extending about as far south as the Powhatan people uh, up through the northeastern United States and through much of eastern and central and into western Canada. So in oh, I suppose ethnographic terms this is the Powhatan people but what were they like well, the sort of uh, lackadaisical attitude towards work that was very real, but very disreputable among English laborers was also very real, but eminently respectable among the Poetans. Uh, like other horticultural tribes in North America, they relied on slash and burn horticulture as opposed to intensive agriculture like the Pueblos. And I, I think emphasized already that slash and burn horticulture isn't capable of supporting a dense population. Yeah, for that you need the diligent, regular hard labor that you have with uh, intensive agriculture. 
in terms of the labor invested, it's quite efficient. It's ideal for supporting a relatively thin or moderate population. And tending to this agricultural work was mostly the responsibility of the women. And you'll recall this was different from the situation with the Pueblo people. With the Pueblo people, it was mixed gender labor. Uh, the women and the men worked cooperatively and together. Uh, producing their intensive agriculture. The Powhatan women uh, were the ones mostly responsible, nearly all responsible, for the horticulture in eastern Virginia. I rather like this drawing. It's uh, by a man named John White, an artist who came to Raleigh's Virginia in 1585 and 1587, so quite early on. Uh, it's worth pointing out that not all portrayals of native people by Europeans, European artists are necessarily inaccurate. And so far as I know, white stuff, including this Powhatan woman, were relatively accurate. Uh, he doesn't either idealize her, uh, glamorize her, uh, bestialize her or anything. Okay, the men's work, while the women were in the gardens, what were the men doing? The men's job was the clearing of the land for the gardens, to make the gardens possible. And this wasn't particularly arduous. Uh, it could was for short periods, but not consistently arduous. It involved girdling trees, tying vines tighter and tighter around trees, and burning. Again, much of what the English would define as man's work was done by the women hoeing, planting, gathering the harvests, gathering wild fruits and berries. The men made canoes, fish wheels, um, which did involve a good deal of work for sporadic work for installation and maintenance. You drive poles down into the mud of shallow water and lace uh, nets around the poles. You do this in fish, fish migratory areas, usually at the, the mouth of a river, and uh, you catch the fish in the nets. So the men built fish wheels, made weapons, made canoes, and did the hunting and fighting. And here's an example of construction. This is from the Caribbean people of the West Indies, uh, but making a large canoe uh, using uh, hot water, carving it out, and then using hot water and uh, using heavy stones to continuously force the side of the, of the tree together until it becomes a canoe. Okay, so for the men in particular, it wasn't particularly an arduous existence. Even for the women, it certainly wasn't anything close to a life of unremitting toil. Now, the usual corn, beans, and squash were grown and supplemented by wild fruits like hickories, black walnuts, plums, persimmons, mulberries, grapes, and strawberries. Uh, that were gathered, not cultivated. The tidewater area of Virginia is crisscrossed by creeks, rivers, and bays, so fish was usually available. For wild game, there were deer and elk, and a bit further inland, inland in Virginia, uh, bison, American bison. Um, it's worth remembering that that Great Plains fixture, the bison, 
which we now associate with uh, where the buffalo roam and the Great Plains. Uh, the bison roamed as far east as central Virginia and the central Carolinas in 1600. So the bison originally wasn't just a plains animal, uh, but also wandered into the woods. Okay, if this sounds like a tasty and nutritious diet, it was. It was far better than the diets in Europe, or for that matter, far better than the Inca or Aztec native people's diets. Um, if you're asking, do earliest, early civilizations produce dull diets? Yeah, probably. Apparently the land, from the descriptions we get from the early colonists, the land had a pleasant park-like experience as well. The practice of burning off fields kept undergrowth down, and as many fires spread out of control, most of the surviving trees around were big and fire resistant. Now, this burning off also made hunting and travel for other purposes, uh, such as visiting or warfare easier. Okay, uh, so again, uh, the clothing question. Um, cotton dominant or preferred down here and up in Pueblo country. Uh, this giant wedge wallow across North America down into Texas. Animal skin and tree bark clothing. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, hide and fur down here. And in this area, uh, hide, fur, and plant materials such as flax down here in the eastern and southeastern United States and throughout the American West and Southwestern Canada. Where did they live? What did they live in? Well, they lived in long houses. Uh, this is a long house, characteristic of a number of other native groups in East and North America. A rectangular barrel roofed house supported by bent saplings and covered with either hides or bark, uh, either would do. The houses were gathered in towns around the cornfields in classic slash and burn style, with apparently several hundred people on average per town. It's also interesting to note that well into the 17th century, well into the 1600s, the native people were the only Virginians living in towns. The English and Scots and Welsh and Irish, as they started to come in, were nearly all scattered up and down the streams on their individual farms, which after 1617, we'll get to that in a minute, after 1617 were sometimes actually large isolated tobacco plantations. So if town living is a mark of civilization, then the early British colonists in Eastern Virginia were not civilized, but the Powhatan Indians were. Okay, uh, again, the Powhatan people here. The early British descriptions were fairly clear about their political organization, so far as they could understand it, so far as they could recognize it. The entire Virginia coast, this whole coast of Virginia, from the Chesapeake 
well up the Chesapeake and down towards the uh, what's now the North Carolina border was dominated by what we could call the Powhatan hegemony. Uh, more on hegemony in a moment. The Powhatan hegemony uh, headed by a man named Powhatan, a member of the Pamunkey tribe. Powhatan had been the principal chief, principal leader of the Pamunkey, and he and his tribe had built up a formidable hegemony of at least 13 to 15,000 Algonquian speaking Indians in Eastern Virginia. Now, we must pause here to recognize the, the difficulty in applying European political terminology to Native American people. And uh, on one of your handouts, I believe, uh, the words hand out, I have empire, hegemony, confederation, tribe, band, theocracy, village, and family all laid out. Well, what among these things were the Poetans? Sometimes in the literature you hear them called a confederacy or an empire, but I like hegemony. The confederacy implies universal consent, that uh, this is a loose union that people willingly moved into. No, not quite. Is that an empire? No. Empire implies central administration. It implies sending people out to do things like collect taxes and make sure that the subjects of the empire are behaving. As those of you who sat in on the uh, Latin American classes that I taught, I will recall, I think the only proper empire in the Western Hemisphere was the Inca Empire uh, down in Northwestern South America but that the Aztecs and a number of other groups, including the Powhatan, are a hegemony. Um, Powhatan, Powhatan and his Pamunkeys had beaten militarily a lot of neighboring tribes, and the neighboring tribes recognized that they were tributary they paid tribute, they were tributary to Powhatan, but Powhatan and his monkeys did not administer them in any sense of the word. They didn't attempt to change their culture. They merely insisted on symbolic recognition that the Pamunkey were a bit superior, <clears throat> that they owed allegiance to Powhatan, and that they had in his leadership something in common. But they weren't administered in any sort of a sense. When we get to the Iroquois uh, up here, under the five tribes, heading here, the Iroquois, Mohawk, the Oneida, Onondaga, Cayugas, and uh, Senecas will uh, get to a real confederation, a formal confederation where tribal leaders got together regularly to talk about what to do, what not to do about confederation policy. So, hegemony, a area of authority, of imposed authority, but not an empire, not a confederacy or a confederation, bigger than a tribe, uh, not led by a spiritual leader uh, claiming to be privy to a pipeline to the spirits, so not a theocracy, 
uh, made up of tribes, villages, and families. Okay, <clears throat> the English, from their perception, thought Poetan had more power than he actually had. They tried, of course, to fit him into their European picture of political organization, empire, monarchy, republic, and so on. So there's a, a certain consistency here. The Europeans come and they try to fit native people into their sphere of knowledge, into the political systems that they're familiar with. And the native people usually try to fit the arriving Europeans into their own ideas of what political and social organization is like. And as we'll see, um, the Poetan often looked at the English as the English tribe, the English tribe. Okay, uh, let's pause here once again uh, for any questions or comments so before we get into the uh, question of warfare and how the Poetan uh, viewed the English. Any comments or questions at this point? Remember, you have to unmute yourself. Hey, Alan. Yeah, Gil. Yeah, the the um, hegemony uh, also had a council of elders called called the Kirokos. May not be pronounced in exactly how they would have pronounced it. <clears throat> But uh, every town, both in the core group and in the alliance group of tribes, about 30 some different peoples, uh, each one uh, sent uh, their elder or Kirokos, <clears throat> and they could override anything the, uh, the central uh, governing uh, would, would make a decision. They could balance that out. It's interesting that the elders wanted, uh, after a while, wanted the Jamestown taken out uh, because of the conflicts and balances and uh, uh, the people at Pamunkey refused to do it uh, on the same time that the Kirokos was trying to get them to do that. But I think it's fascinating, this system of governance of somewhat decentralization uh, that operated there. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, it's certainly not accurate to talk about any sort of centralized administration. I think um, Powhatan was recognized as the, uh, not the supreme dictator or anything like that. And as in most, but not all, uh, Native American uh, political cultures, there was a good deal more flexibility than you'd expect to find in, say, European. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the Powhatan did not just come in and say, this is what I want and this is what mm -hmm. we want to do. But you know, at the same time, they recognized until he got the, you know, his superior leadership qualities. So there was a good deal of, of to and fro, toing and froing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly not the structural toing and froing on a larger scale that I think you had with the Iroquois. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, anything else? Thanks, Gil. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, let's 
let's get back to it. Laurie, can you mute everybody again? Uh, that is done, Alan. You can continue. Okay. We are back to it. And uh, let's talk a bit about warfare and emphasize that with so much leisure and uh, generally comfortable and uh, until European diseases arrived, which they did not arrive in any scale with the early Jamestown settlers. Uh, smallpox wasn't everywhere at all times. Um, so with a fairly healthy lifestyle, a generally comfortable life, um, battle seems to have been a good means to occupy energy and time, uh, to win honor and display male courage, and uh, demonstrate uh, tribal superiority. As with tribes further north and west, if you were captured, you took great pride in exhi exhibiting stoicism under bad treatment. Uh, if you captured someone else, you sometimes devised uh, rather blood curdling torments to give that person every opportunity to display manly virtue. And you realized that if you were captured, uh, perhaps your captors would give you the same opportunity. It was the gentlemanly thing to do. Warfare was also an opportunity to gain additional women and children to augment the numbers of the tribe. You would adopt them. Uh, usually this was with women and children, sometimes for men too. Sometimes uh, men or other people from friendly tribes were also adopted. Powhatan early on as the most powerful, not the only powerful, but the most powerful local Indian knew at the beginning that the English were helpless. And uh, yes, as, as Gill indicated, for the first decade of the, the settlement of Virginia and perhaps beyond that, if the indigenous people had simply gone away, never mind attacked, they'd simply gone away, not traded with them, the English colony would almost certainly have dissolved into starvation. Okay, how did the Poetons view the English? Well, that silver cup that I mentioned that Roanoke allegedly stole from the 1685 colonists on Roanoke Island, it may well have happened. Uh, the Powhatans saw the English settlers, the early English settlers as the English tribe, as another tribe. Again, I think the human tendency is to try to fit people into the worldview that you know, especially if you have no idea, as the Poetan early on didn't, as the number of people back in Great Britain and Europe, uh, the relative population density in Great Britain and Europe. As for that matter, they had no idea of the population density in the Aztec hegemony and its population. Okay, so they saw them as the English tribe, a tribe with jazzy technology, really peculiar habits, and uh, grossly incompetent men. As an ally, no, not given the way they behaved. Uh, likely enemies, yeah, but enemies with whom some business could be transacted. And in the case of an enemy or an uncertain trial, potential enemy, well, thievery can be fair game. It's important to emphasize that supplies sent from England to Virginia were erratic and sparse at best. 
The Poetons were no more impressed than the Roanoke had been by the way the English seemed to learn so slowly. The Pamunkeys and others of the Poetan hegemony, hegemony <laughs> of the Poetan hegemony quickly adopted firearms, uh, muskets, uh, to their own warfare and lost any early exaggerated respect for them. The Pamunkey and I think other area tribes saw the English precariously hanging on, but with some powerful tools like that hoe, that iron hoe, as a potentially useful factor in the domestic, political, and military machinations of the native people. The English were useful supplies of trade goods, and as they became more established, uh, as we get further on into the 17th century, some of the Virginia tribes began to see them as potential allies against other tribes. And again, I think very few, if any, of the native people at this time and place had any idea of the population, the density, relative density of population uh, back in England. Okay, we uh, I briefly flashed this map on before. Uh, this is basically what Virginia looked like from 1607 uh, to 1675, uh, from 1607 to 1675. 1675 was an important date as, as we'll see. Uh, this map shows in native villages uh, scattered here and there and an increasing number in those years up to 1675 of uh, various English settlements. <clears throat> Again, you're not going to see in Virginia the development of much significant urban culture. Uh, eventually, uh, you're going to see Jamestown uh, develop into a, a proper town. After all, eventually, uh, the British government had to start sending over uh, proper governors and administrative staff and hiring local administrative staff, and they had to work out of some sort of a center. But initially, and certainly compared with the uh, contemporary settlements in New England, uh, the Virginia settlements were very much scattered. So, warfare. The first seven years of the colony from 1607 uh, to 1614 featured off and on guerrilla warfare with serious raiding and some, but not a lot, major fighting back and forth. After 1609, the major fighting broke out. And from 1609 to 1614, historians recognize uh, the first of what they call the Anglo-Poetan Wars. Uh, by 1614, Poetan, by then in his late 60s, uh, was personally feeling his ears and broken. And the English had learned at last to be less provocative as gradually they learned to grow their own food and become less dependent on food supplied by the Indians. So you had a scattering of English settlements, um, 
after 1617, we'll be getting to that in just a minute, after 1617, often increasingly substantial plantations, but still very local, still very scattered, still very open to attack by the native people if they chosen to attack. But then in 1617, a ban a year uh, in the history of the economy of Virginia and the world, world's trade, the trade of the world, uh, and also a ban a year in the respiratory history of the human race, the first shipment of tobacco to England from Virginia. Beginning in 1617, adopting a Native American crop, tobacco, the colonists found the basis for a solid economic life. Should mention that uh, tobacco is not one of the commodities that the theorists in England have seen as a profitable basis for a colonial economy. Uh, they just hadn't thought of that. They weren't quite sure what would be exported, but they hadn't really thought of tobacco. Uh, king James the uh, first, who was also King James the sixth of Scotland, uh, he moved south uh, from Edinburgh to London uh, when he became King of England on Elizabeth's death. Uh, king James the first uh, was one of the more literate and uh, interesting of the British monarchs, uh, he did not like tobacco. He wrote a lot about it, he expounded on it, uh, he warned people that this was bad for your health, you shouldn't be inhaling this stuff. Um, you could call King James the first the first anti-tobacco crusader, uh, including head health warnings, but it did no good no good at all, and tobacco use in England and eventually just about everywhere in the world skyrocketed. In fact, I think it's worth uh, mentioning that uh, tobacco was now, beginning in 1617, on its way to becoming the first worldwide trading commodity. Uh, within a few hundred years, it was traded just about everywhere uh, through uh, British traders in what became Northern Canada and Northern North America. It found its way uh, to the Inuit people, the Inuit, the Eskimo people in uh, Northern North America. So tobacco, uh, the very first worldwide trading commodity, uh, of course, <clears throat> specie, gold and silver, but the first commodity that wasn't just a valuable metal, but a valuable commodity, uh, shipped everywhere. Well, after 1617, things ticked along fairly peacefully, peacefully for a while. Uh, in 1616, uh, the Powhatan, now in effect uh, led by Powhatan's brother, Powhatan's brother Opakan Kano, uh, had basically taken over the leadership role previously held by his brother in the Powhatan hegemony. Um, the Powhatan had used English allies by 1616. Uh, the English colonies, uh, the English colony was well organized enough and prosperous enough, even before the coming of uh, tobacco, uh, to be looked upon as a possibly useful ally. And Open Opacan Canal had used the English to overcome the Chickahominy 
a nearby tribe. I see, I don't think the Chickahominy show up on this map. No, but the uh, the Chickahominy were were giving the uh, Powhatan some difficulties, and uh, Opakankanau uh, used the British as allies to overcome them. For a while, the tobacco income flowing into the colony led to a drop in food production as settlers rushed to grow the weed. But the money coming in for the tobacco meant that the colonists could purchase food from the Indians with their trade goods. So this is a good deal all around. Uh, <clears throat> for a time, uh, the two groups got together reasonably well. And it's worth emphasizing here that the British impact on the Indians of Virginia was much slower than that of the Spanish in Mexico, Peru, or North America. <clears throat> there were no marches of conquest. There was no long distance exploration and devastating. There were no cities or large towns to conquer. Uh, particularly once tobacco arrived, the Jamestown and the other settlers were more than happy to spread slowly inland along the estuaries and rivers of the uh, Virginia Tidewater. And uh, after 1617, to grow as much tobacco as they possibly could, <clears throat> for shipment back to Britain. But in 1618, Powhatan died himself. And Opakan Canal, his brother, was now formally and by consensus at the top of the heap. And Opakan Canal are recognized a and now multiplying colonists. While many Eng English and Indians had thought that the post-1614 relative tranquility was a good deal, those few years there, Opakan Canal uh, knew better. He began to have some idea <clears throat> of how many British people there were. Uh, he recognized the danger, I think, of the early tobacco economy and the idea that British settlers will just keep coming and coming. Okay, it's getting close to closing time. So and before we get into the uh, second uh, war, uh, the Second anglo powhatan War. Uh, let's open it up for questions and comments before we break up for another week. As a reminder, you need to unmute yourself to ask your questions. Comments, questions? Criticisms, remarks, nasty gestures. Alan. Alan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Bill. Um, I was just looking on the internet here. It says that Paul Houghton actually also farmed tobacco. Did they do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the English Native Americans used tobacco. Um, they seem to have had, oh, I suppose, more sense than to use it as a uh, casual drug, <clears throat> as <laughs> the rest of the world have often done. But oh yeah, yeah, they did. That, that's where the English got it. Right. But did they did they export it? Did they sell it? Did they export it? Did they sell it to the English? Did they what? Sell it to the English? Yeah. 
Yeah, they had no idea. Uh, I don't, I couldn't give you any detail on when they sold the first tobacco to the, uh, the British colonists in, in Eastern Virginia, but someone must have. And uh, after 1617, the British recognized it as a really good cash crop. But yeah, <clears throat> yeah, um, it's worth emphasizing here, and I haven't really talked about this, that there was a good deal short, medium, and even long distance trade among the native people of North America. So if you were not in a tobacco growing area, but you liked tobacco, you might be able to import it. If you were in a uh, area where you could find greenstone, jade, um, you might be able to trade some of that uh, for some tobacco. So there was a good deal of commerce back and forth. And uh, now we won't get into that to the detail that, uh, that it deserves, but there was a considerable intra-tribal trade. It wasn't just fighting, it was intra-tribal trade uh, back and forth. And yeah, uh, the English got tobacco from the native people. Hi, Alan, this is Carolyn Rao. Hi. Have you read James Mitcher's book, Chesapeake? You know, I have not read Mitchner's Chesapeake. Uh, Dana keeps telling me I should. It's and I read, I read some of, of Mitchner's stuff and then I kind of got turned off on it. So I, I have not, I have not read Chesapeake. Uh, you recommend it? I do. I think it's his best one. Oh, really? So, so you may not really like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you. I will. Uh, well, I shouldn't thank you, Carolyn. I've got a list of pile of books <laughs> that I read, but I'll add that to the pile. Um, because okay, I, good. I, Dana has suggested it several times too, and uh, Chesapeake. Okay, thank you. Okay. What do you particularly Alan. Like Alan. Yeah. Oh. Andrea. Um, if you look at this map um, that you have up here, you, it really shows how everything is on a river and they yeah. uh, when we were there they stressed how because there were no roads in that that the both the um indians and the, especially the english used them as highways all the plantations were on the you know so they could go get in their boats and go wherever they needed to and, um pretty much always on rivers and it really shows that way too on this map. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I think that that's definitely true. And uh, again, there's a contrast with the New England settlers where you didn't have uh, these easily navigable large estuaries and rivers. Well, as you know, and as you can tell from the map, if people who haven't been in the area, uh, these are big. Um, up and down Chesapeake Bay, the Potomac River, sizable river all the way up to what's now Washington. And yeah, and of course the Indians used uh, the rivers too, both the uh, larger ones and the smaller ones for travel and for fishing. Uh, that's why I emphasize the canoe construction. So yeah, thanks, good point. Alan, this is Bill. A couple of thoughts come to mind. In my, in my travels, one of the things I've noticed uh, in Europe, in Germany, in England, but especially in Germany, uh, out in the rural areas, people live in the little villages and then they go out into the fields. Uh, in this country, uh, people moved and lived out in the fields. And your map is showing that in Virginia. Uh, yeah. People are not living in Jamestown 
and then going out and cultivating the fields and then coming home that night. Uh, they've built out on these streams and uh, that's where they live. The, the other thought is, is if the Indians were trading with the English for things like guns and so forth, they had to have something that the English wanted and tobacco would very likely be one of those things. Oh yeah, tobacco and uh, <clears throat> then uh, once the uh, once tobacco became a big cash crop uh, for the British settlers, um, the Indians would be happy to trade food for some of the commodities, so the cloth, the weapons, uh, the hoes, and so on, the tools that uh, definitely were technologically superior to what they they had before the arrival of the Europeans. So for a time there, the Europeans were useful, the Native Americans were useful. So there were times, there were stretches, when uh, things worked out pretty well for them. And uh, as we'll see when we get to the Iroquois, uh, which we may or may not get to do in in this six weeks class, for a long time, the Iroquois Confederation managed to uh, work very well with the uh, both the British and the French. But yeah, thanks, Bill. Yeah, and that uh, that uh, observation from Germany, very good. Anything else? Are we dismiss, Laurie? Well, Roy's you, just Helen. unmuted. So do you have a oh, question, Oh, I just Roy's? unmuted because I was, no, I was just going to say thank you for a great oh, class. Okay. <laughs> All right, see unless anybody time. else have any questions, we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank see you. you.